And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. On Sunday, President Obama addressed the influential pro-Israel lobbying group, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or AIPAC, emphasizing the U.S., quote, will not hesitate to use force to stop Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons. In his speech in Washington, D.C., Obama reiterated his unwavering support for Israel and willingness to consider military options against Iran. I have said that when it comes to preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, I will take no options off the table. And I mean what I say. That includes all elements of American power. A political effort aimed at isolating Iran, a diplomatic effort to sustain our coalition and ensure that the Iranian program is monitored, an economic effort that imposes crippling sanctions, and yes, a military effort to be prepared for any contingency. However, President Obama also made clear his preference for diplomacy. He suggested the policy of sanctions set in motion by the United States and Europe remain the most viable way to dissuade Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. Moving forward, I would ask that we all remember the weightiness of these issues. The stakes involved for Israel, for America, and for the world. Already there is too much loose talk of war. Over the last few weeks, such talk has only benefited the Iranian government by driving up the price of oil, which they depend on to fund their nuclear program. For the sake of Israel's security, America's security, and the peace and security of the world, now is not the time for bluster. That's the time to let our increased pressure sink in and to sustain the broad international coalition we have built. Meanwhile, protesters with the group called Occupy APAC rallied outside the conference chanting, no war on Iran. One protester, Ty Barry, said he'd traveled from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. to protest APAC. We have the president of the United States addressing the, law, the most powerful lobbying group in the world, APEC, that continues. They've pushed us into a war with Iraq, and they're trying to push us into a war with Iran. We're saying free Palestine. We're saying negotiate and free to, for peace in Palestine, peace with Iran. And we need to stop. We need to get nuclear, power out, nuclear weapons out of the Middle East. That includes Israel. Meanwhile, Obama is scheduled to meet today with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the White House. Addressing reporters in Ottawa, Canada, Netanyahu responded favorably to Obama's APEC speech. I've just had the opportunity to hear the president's speech. I very much appreciated the fact that President Obama reiterated his position that Iran must not be allowed to develop nuclear weapons and that all options are on the table. Although the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, APEC, and its sympathizers convene annually, this year's gathering was especially fraught with significance given the election year politics and heightening tensions between Iran and Israel. During their meeting today, Netanyahu is expected to continue pressuring Obama to adopt a more stringent line on Iran. Specifically, he wants Obama to explicitly state the circumstances under which the U.S. itself would strike Iran. Israeli officials are also demanding Iran halts all enrichment of uranium before before the West resumes negotiations with Tehran. However, the White House has rejected this precondition as a sticking to its policy of economic sanctions, with military action as a last resort. For more on Obama's position on Iran and Israel, we're joined now by two guests. From Philadelphia, we're joined by Jonathan Tobin, the senior online editor of Commentary magazine. His latest piece is called What's Missing from Obama's APEC Speech, Red Lines on Iran and Palestinians. Tobin's scholar columns have also regularly appeared in the Jerusalem Post and elsewhere. Here in New York, we're joined by Rashid Khalidi. He's the Edward Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia University's Department of History and the author of several books including Sewing Crisis, American Dominance, and Iron Cage, the story of the Palestinian struggle for statehood. Jonathan Tobin, Professor Khalidi, welcome both to Democracy Now! Let's begin with Jonathan Tobin. Uh, what was your assessment of President Obama's APEC speech, and what did you feel was missing? Well, I think um, the main takeaways from uh, the president's speech are two things. Number one, place it in the perspective of his four years, uh, his three-plus years in the presidency. 
his speech yesterday was remarkable. What was remarkably absent was ma mainly the substance of a lot of what his uh, policy towards Israel has been in his first three years, which was pressure, um, contention over Jerusalem, settlements, the 1967 borders, which was the big dust up from last year. And all of that was gone. Um, that has uh, pretty much been uh, thrown by the wayside, in part because of the Palestinians' failure to uh, sort of come to the president's aid or, or to, to uh, pick up on his hints. Um, so that was out. And he moved much closer to the uh, pro-Israel community's position on, on the issues. Also included in it, I, sh I should say, is that um, as much as he uh, was talking about continued diplomacy, he did say that the United States would not countenance um, a nuclear Iran, and more importantly, that he rejected a policy of containment, which is a lot of what we've been hearing from those who, who wish to back away from a confrontation, saying that we can live with a nuclear Iran. Obama was specifically saying that he didn't do that. He wouldn't live with it. However, where he didn't go was to state some red lines uh, over which Iran could not go in terms of its nuclear enrichment, in terms of uh, more progress on its uh, nuclear program. Uh, if it went beyond that, what the United States would do. He's still talking about sanctions and more diplomacy. And I think some people who fear the consequences of nuclear Iran, which is a group that includes much of the Arab world, many of the Arab, Arab governments in the Middle East, and not just Israel. I think there's the fear that the president is sort of relying too much on the hope of diplomacy and the hope of sanctions, when not too many people are really placing a lot of, uh, a lot of hope in that, because the Iranians seem determined to press ahead no matter what the, the United States says and no matter what sort of economic pain is presented to them, in addition to the fact that Although the president said yesterday that Russia and China are on board with sanctions, that's not entirely the case, as the Chinese seem appeared to be willing to buy uh, Iranian oil, uh, even in the event of, uh, of a European and American embargo. So the fear is that what the Ayatollahs are listening to in his speech is the idea that they can keep pre you know, prevaricating, they can kick the can down the road. And as uh, Les Gelb of the Council of Foreign Relations wrote a couple of weeks ago, in that they may have a common uh, agenda with Obama, because the, the president does not wish to have a confrontation, um, certainly until, until no November. Um, he doesn't want to fight a war in, in an election year or to be seen to be backing away from Iran um, during yeah. this time, because he's, he's at pains to, you know, he's really worried about uh, losing the pro-Israel vote and the Jewish vote. Uh, Professor Halliday, your response to President Obama's speech and to what Jonathan Tobin has said? Well, President Obama's speech was an attempt to feed some red meat to this audience on everything but Iran because he is convinced, as is every sane, rational person in the U.S. government, that a war with Iran would be catastrophic for the United States, that it wouldn't serve the purposes that the advocates of war are, are pushing for, and that it's completely unnecessary, given that there's no evidence that the Iranians have a nuclear weapons program. That's the unanimous uh, opinion of the intelligence community, including, it appears, the Israeli intelligence community, by the way, not just the American. So uh, the president was pushing back on those issues, even though he did give a little ground. Uh, uh, but by contrast, as, as Mr. Tubin to said, um, he airbrushed out uh, his differences with Prime Minister Netanyahu over the first two years of his presidency in order to emphasize the many ways in which the United States has aligned itself with Israel, and he listed them. Uh, things like uh, support. Actually, let me no, play what he has to say. Mm -hmm. uh, this is President Obama making that list during his speech to AIPAC and enumerating the many ways he and his administration have been strong allies with Israel. As a senator, I spoke to Israeli troops on the Lebanese border. I visited with families who've known the terror of rocket fire in Starot. And that's why, as president, I have provided critical funding to deploy the Iron Dome system that has intercepted rockets that might have hit homes and hospitals and schools in that town and in others. Now our assistance is expanding Israel's defensive capabilities so that more Israelis can live free from the fear of rockets and ballistic missiles, because no family, no citizen, should live in fear. 
And just as we've been there with our security assistance, we've been there through our diplomacy. When the Goldstone Report unfairly singled out Israel for criticism, we challenged it. When Israel was isolated in the aftermath of the flotilla incident, we supported them. When the Durban conference was commemorated, we boycotted it, and we will always reject the notion that Zionism is racism. President Obama speaking yesterday at the APEC conference, uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi. Well, he went on and on, in fact. You, you got the meat of it. But he went on and on, talking about the things that he had done. Uh, the United States would continue to uh, oppose a campaign of boycott, divestment, sanctions, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that the, that the key thing here is not just this issue of Iran, because the hysteria over Iran, the hysteria that a lot of the media, the hysteria that some of the think tanks, the hysteria that one wing of the Israeli government, not a lot of sane Israelis actually support this. There's a very strong faction in the Israeli military, former generals, serving generals, former intelligence uh, senior officials and, and some serving uh, officials in Israel who feel exactly the same way as the entire American intelligence community and military, that this is, A, a very, very dangerous thing to suggest going to war with Iran, and B, that it's completely unnecessary. Um, in spite of that, there's this extraordinary hysteria, which the Republicans are irresponsibly, uh, I think, uh, trying to, trying to in increase, and that uh, the people, uh, many of the people, at least at this conference uh, in Washington, uh, I think are playing a part in. And I, I, I think the president, uh, uh, sadly, uh, instead of forthrightly opposing elements of the narrative that lead us there, has adopted many of them. Uh, uh, for example, he talks about uh, Israelis suffering. Well, Israelis obviously have suffered. There's no mention in his speeches of Palestinian suffering. There's no mention in his speeches of the fact that he's facing an Israeli government that has steadfastly refused to budge an inch uh, in terms of issues that presidents going back to Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr. have tried to push Israel on settlements and so on and so forth. Uh, the president backed down after his first two years in office on all of these issues. And uh, uh, he's probably rightly concentrating on this Iran issue. But unfortunately, what he's in effect done is to throw the Palestinians and, I think, the possibility of serious peacemaking under the bus, at least until this election campaign is over. Jonathan Tobin, your response. Well, I think there are a couple of things. Number one, um, in terms of a great diversity of opinion in Israel, I think there there's some, obviously, Israel is a... <laughs> A, a lively democracy, and that democracy is, extends into the military and the former members of the military. However, I think the, it's, it's somewhat disingenuous to claim that there's a big debate about whether Iran is a nuclear threat. There is a debate, however, how Israel or how the West should attempt to head off or forestall an Iranian nuclear weapon. The, most for, the foremost opponent of Netanyahu and Defense Minister Barak uh, in terms of uh, possibly attacking Iran is the former head of the, uh, the Mossad, Amir Dagan. And he's, his position is not that Iran is not dangerous, not that Iran's nuclear program is not a, a deadly and existential threat, but that he thinks that it's better uh, countered by, uh, by uh, covert action rather than uh, an air campaign. As far as the president and the Palestinians, I, I think it's also uh, wrong to say that, uh, the, that, that the president has thrown the Palestinians under the bus. It's the Palestinians who threw him under the bus over the course of uh, his administration, because every time he uh, picked a fight with Netanyahu when he pressured Israel. Uh, the Palestinians de didn't step forward. When, when Netanyahu finally gave in to Obama and agreed to a settlement freeze for a period of time, the Palestinians didn't even negotiate then. They haven't negotiated since they walked away from Ehud Olmert's offer of a, of, of a Palestinian state in, in the most, almost all of the West Bank, Gaza, and a part of Jerusalem. So to say that, uh, to say that the president hasn't tried for the Palestinians, he certainly has. And he's been rewarded uh, and, and by, by a rebuff. As far as um, the idea that uh, it's not sane to be to 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 be concerned about Iran, I think I think there's a broad consensus, and a broad consensus even in the Holiday. region. Let, that... let me get Professor Holiday's response to that, who also himself is Palestinian American. Sure. 
Well, two things. Uh, it's, I think it's perfectly sane to be concerned about Iran. I think it's insane to think that a war on Iran would not create the problem that it's supposed to solve. A war on Iran guarantees that Iran will develop nuclear weapons. Uh, there's a very strong possibility that Iran can be prevented from doing that, or has no actual intention of doing so and no capability of doing so in the foreseeable future. Uh, so uh, the issue is to make war on Iran or not. The issue is not, would it be a bad thing for a country other than Israel to have nuclear weapons in the Middle East? Yes, it would be bad. In fact, it would be, it is bad to have nuclear weapons in the Middle East, because Israel having nuclear, we nuclear weapons sooner or later is going to create a nuclear arms race. The president very quietly has said, uh, he should be saying it much more forcefully, that nuclear nonproliferation in the Middle East is in the interest of Israelis, Arabs, Iranians, and the United States. Uh, uh, Israel having a, this huge nuclear arsenal uh, is the unspoken element in all of this. And Iran is constantly vilified. The Iranians do a, a great deal to vilify themselves, let it be said. Uh, this is a regime that said horrific things and has done bad things. But uh, they are not the existential danger to Israel that they are portrayed. Sane Israelis know that, including most Israeli security managers. They manipulate that fear uh, in, this, in this country and in Israel. Um, but uh, m the president said American and Israeli uh, intelligence estimates are that Israel, uh, that Iran does not have a capability or uh, is anywhere near this. Uh, that is actually the view of the Israeli intelligence community. That is also the view of most of the Israeli military. And that's come out in the Israeli press. I mean, yes, there is as great a fear in Iran, uh, sorry, in Israel, about the possibility of, of, uh, of uh, Iran getting nuclear weapons as people make out. But that does not mean that the security managers share that. To some extent, I have to say, I think they're manipulating that fear. And that Palestinians, as Jonathan Tobin said, Palestinians let Obama down? Well, I, I mean, that's a whole, that's a, there's a whole litany of things that have to be addressed there. Uh, the Palestinians are, are, are divided, let it be said. There, there is a, an important division among Palestinians. The president is not helped uh, resolve that problem. Uh, what Israel has tried to do is to demonize one wing of the Palestinian national movement, Hamas. Uh, in, the, in the American, in, in, in the United States, that has also succeeded. Uh, without the Palestinians getting their act together, unifying, and deciding how they want to deal with this issue, including via negotiations. And one of the things that Hamas has said is that it is willing to allow the Palestinian Authority to negotiate uh, for a two state solution. I'm not particularly uh, happy. Uh, about some of the ideas that may come out of a coalition between the two main Palestinian factions. But the idea that you can deal with one elected faction and leave the other elected faction out is, is, is false. Uh, people don't like what Hamas stands for. Let them get into governing. Let them get into negotiating, which they will do if this compromise that the Palestinians are working towards is allowed. The president explicitly excluded that in his speech more red meat uh, thrown to Israel. You cannot make peace with the Palestinians while consciously and, 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 and seriously working to divide them. Palestinians have to be united if they're going to figure out how they're going to deal with these issues that face them. And that's a precondition. And the president, unfortunately, has, has passed on that. We're talking to Columbia University professor Rashid Khalidi, uh, as well as Jonathan Tobin of Commentary Magazine. We'll be back with both of them in a minute. We'll talk about Syria, Iran, Israel, and continue to talk about the Palestinians. Stay with us.